Hello? Hi. Good evening. My name is Madeline Tomka, and I'm the co-chair of the National Affairs Series Planning Committee. It's a pleasure to welcome you all this evening. Um, the National Affairs Series on Innovation is honored to share tonight with the Pi Beta Kappa Lecture Series. So before we introduce tonight's speaker, I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, including the Geology and Atmospheric Sciences, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Miller Lecture Funds, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the government of the student body. The World Affairs Series planners have asked us to remind everyone that the panel on the Middle East peace process has been moved from next Wednesday to now April 5th. So the upcoming National Affairs speakers include the New Belgium Brewery founder and CEO and maker of Fat Tire Beer, Kim Jordan, will be talking about innovation and the environment on Tuesday, February 22nd at 8 p.m. in the sunroom. We are also very proud to announce the NOAA, Jane Lupacheno, who heads the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, will be speaking on Tuesday, March 1st at 8 p.m. in the sunroom. Later in that week, Pulitzer Prize winning writer will be speaking about the man who invented the computer also in the sunroom, and that will be Jane Smiley. So more information for these lectures and others are available at the door, and we'd also like to encourage you to stay afterwards for a few questions and more conversation with the speaker and a reception. So now, here's Leanne Wilson, who will introduce tonight's speaker. She is a university professor of astronomy at Iowa State and has been on faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy since 1973. She currently serves as vice president of the American Astronomical Society, and her own areas of research include stellar gerontology, or what happens to stars like the sun when they die. So, including the fates of our planet. So here she is. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, I must admit that the courses that I've enjoyed the most teaching over the years I've been here have been the solar system courses because they're never the same twice in a row. And people like our speaker tonight are responsible for that continually changing curriculum. Um, Peter Smith got his first degree from the University of California, Berkeley in 1969, went on to the University of Arizona Optical Science Center, and then joined the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Lab in 1978. He's participated in many of the important space missions that have explored the solar system since then. Pioneer Saturn in 1979 initiated nearly a decade of study in outer planet atmospheres, particularly for Jupiter and Titan. Mysterious cloud entrouded Titan became the focus for Smith's research, and he became the project manager for a descent camera on the Huygens mission to the surface of Titan that landed in early 2005 and returned the first close up images of Titan's surface. Tomorrow at 4.10, he will give a slightly more technical talk on the Titan results in Room 5 physics, to which people are welcome to come as well. In 1993, Smith took on a key role with the Mars Pathfinder mission. His camera returned the first images from the Martian surface on July 4, 1997, and some of you may recall how the day-to-day -day images of alien landscape explored by the Sojourner rover were featured on the front pages of newspapers and on the television networks. In the fall of 2003, Smith's Phoenix project was selected as the first scout mission to Mars. The spacecraft launched on August 4, 2007 and will land in the north polar region of Mars on May 25th. Will land. I guess this is an old website I pulled it up from. <laughs> Did land. And anyway, now he's going to tell us about the next phase of Martian exploration, the search for life. Well, I was walking around campus today. I was wondering, with the cold weather here in Iowa, do people live longer? Are you preserved, like in a deep freezer. Reminds me, uh, years ago, I had an idea for a, a weight reduction facility where you would take your clients and put them into freezers and have them shiver, because that takes so much energy to keep your body warm that obviously you'd lose weight. 
But uh, I couldn't get backing for that project, unfortunately. I'm not sure why. Okay, search for life on Mars. This is, uh, I think, intrigued people for many, many uh, decades and even uh, centuries. And uh, here we have a picture from Robert McCall, one of our famous uh, space painters. And there's an astronaut in some future year. And he's, um, I think, finding some sort of new mineral. And doesn't it look fun, though? I mean, I think for young people in this room, uh, there is a possibility that uh, you could become an astronaut and go to Mars and wear a jet pack like this and fly around an alien planet. It'd be really exciting, drive a little car. I think the future is really uh, quite remarkable for space studies. We've had the robotic age, but at some point there'll be the human exploration age. The only question is which flag will be on the astronaut's arm, I think. Okay, so as we go back through time, for most of human history, uh, the planets have been the objects of myths and dreams and fantasies. And of course, uh, we thought of Mars as the war god when we were back uh, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And all we knew about planets was that there were little dots of light that moved against the background stars. They were called the wanderers, which is what planet means. And so there was all kinds of ideas about what these wanderers in the sky might be. But it wasn't until um, 400 years ago with the invention of the telescope and the use of it by Galileo that we started to have an idea that it wasn't just a dot of light, it wasn't a god or a, a fantasy uh, uh, creation, it was a real place. And uh, by 1683 we had some good maps of Mars, uh, not very different than maps you could draw a hundred years later, it's, it's very difficult to see Mars. Uh, every two years it would get close and you would have a good chance. But these are the kind of maps that we had of Mars and already we could tell that the day was nearly 24 hours and that there was um, seasons and all kinds of things that made it a real world. And even in the 17th centuries there was books written about what sort of life might be on Mars. And a couple of hundred years later with um, uh, the really high-tech telescopes of 1900 and that famous Arizonan named Percival Lowell, and this is Percival Lowell here, observing through his telescope, made a map of Mars that included uh, some very interesting thin lined features that he interpreted as canals. Canals to bring water from the polar regions where we could tell that there was ice, and melting the ice and bringing water down to the crops in the equatorial region. And Percival Lowell wrote several books about this that sparked the interest of many, many people. Unfortunately, years later, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image with the same kind of uh, appearance. You can see a lot of these features line up, but there are no canals. But even so, in 1900, it really sparked imagination that there was a possibility for life on Mars and even intelligent life, and it started a, a new literature of science fiction. And it was that science fiction that inspired me, among others, uh, that science was really an exciting field and, and who knew what the future could hold. And so in, when, in the 50s when I was reading science fiction, I could imagine by the 80s we would be off to Mars and Jupiter and, and uh, my imagination knew no bounds. So I, I really got excited when I read about stories of Mars and imagined that there were six-legged apes and, and there's 13-year-old uh, Peter Smith trying to re rescue his girlfriend from the uh, six-legged apes. And, and the world of fantasy, of course, is just so much fun. But uh, eventually, we come to know that this is not reality. And, and with the space age and missions to Mars, we know that Mars is actually uninhabited. There are no intelligent beings there that we're able to find. And uh, instead, our strategy is, is there any water on Mars somewhere that we can actually hope to find uh, a source of life. And so this is a chart, a famous chart in NASA that defines the goals of the national mission. And, and it is to look for life, to understand the climate, to really in depth explore the geology and prepare for human missions. And cutting across this, the common thread is liquid water, not ice, but liquid water. 
And so our missions have been all about finding liquid water on Mars. Now, on the Earth, there's no problem finding liquid water. We're three quarters of the surface of the planet is, of course, liquid. But on Mars, there are no oceans. There's a few little water ice clouds that appear now and again, but uh, apparently no rain. So very big difference between Earth and Mars. Mars is about half the size of the Earth. It's farther away from the sun, therefore it's colder. It has a very thin atmosphere of CO2, carbon dioxide. And uh, the kind of place that if humans set down there, they'd have to be protected with spacesuits and have breathing apparatus and, and protection from the harsh radiation of space. Well, as uh, uh, it was pointed out, I was involved in the Pathfinder mission in 1997, and a picture from my camera looked something like this. We had a little rover, and we drove around, and in my uh, imagination, remember I have a background in science fiction, I was hoping against hope that somewhere there would be a little bit of chlorophyll or something that our cameras could see, but instead we kind of validated the understanding of Mars that it's cold, dry, dusty, and rocky and uh, has kind of a, a, a yellowish, uh, brownish atmosphere, which is mostly dust. So dust and rock, that seems to be what Mars was about. And we sent a rover around to look at the rocks, and they were mostly um, uh, volcanic rocks. So how do we search for life on Mars, and how do we have any hope that we'll find it? That's what I want to talk about tonight. And there's many ways to search for Martian life, and let me just run through a few of them. Uh, one is to look at the extremes on Earth and see if we can find environments on the Earth that are somewhat similar to the environments we know are on Mars. So we have done searches, and I personally have been several places where searches have happened, and of course there's many others I'm not involved with. And uh, one that interests me is the uh, polar regions, and it turns out on the Earth, <clears throat> The colored regions here that surround the North Pole are permafrost. In other words, the soil is always uh, below freezing, um, and there's no point where it, or there's always a point that's below freezing all year round, and therefore you get a, a frozen uh, landscape above about 60 degrees. The um, Siberian um, landmass here is huge and covers a tremendous amount. Of, uh, of the percentage of the Earth's surface. So that 20 to 25 percent of terrestrial environments, 20 to 25 percent, are permafrost. And we can see northern Canada, Alaska, Siberia, the Tibetan Plateau. All of these areas are holding and preserving uh, life that's up to 20,000 to 3 million years old. There's signatures that go back that far. And so we can look at organisms that um, have perhaps gone extinct a million years ago, and we can slowly heat them up out of this ice and bring them back to life. And, and this scares some people. They think, well, maybe some of those are pathogens, and, and they should have uh, gone extinct. What if we bring them back to life and they come to, to uh, attack us? But be that as it may, there is a lot of interesting life in this frozen soil. I went to a meeting once, and there was an Australian guy who sounded a lot like uh, the governor of California, the, the last governor, and uh, he said he had picked a, a chunk of soil out of uh, Siberia, just an ordinary chunk with no particular interest, done a, a DNA analysis, and was able to create the tree of life from that one chunk of soil from Siberia. So the ice contains a lot of the record of life on Earth. So uh, I went to uh, Antarctica as part of an expedition to try and learn more about what can be kept in frozen soil and, and, and what we can learn from it. And uh, this was my tent right here. We uh, landed in a place where you could see some very interesting cracked ground. That's because the ice expands and contracts. I, I don't know if you have that in Iowa or not, but you certainly do in Alaska and northern Canada. And uh, big glacier masses of ice, and the ocean is not far away, so we're at sea level here. And we're down low enough that in the summer you can actually get some melt back on the frozen lakes where it's very shallow. You can actually get a, a moat of water around there. 
And if you look in that water, you can see that there's bacterial mats. This is a bacterial mat. It's actually a colony of various types of plants and animals that live together. Um, it's sort of bio, biosymbiosis, symbiosis, biosymbiosis. And so these different uh, creatures live together in a community and, and uh, do very well. And, and of course, you can actually find fossils of these uh, communities in the sand dunes around the lake. So this is the kind of thing you might expect to find on Mars, is communities of single-celled animals and plants that have learned to live together, and this is the kind of fossils you might look for. But uh, I was interested to find out that in Antarctica and these bacterial mats, there's actually a predator. And it's sort of like the um, uh, buffalo on the prairie here. The, the predator is the mighty nematode, which is a tiny little worm about a millimeter long. But in this world, tiny creatures can rule. And so the nematode is, is the one that dominates down in Antarctica. Um, Another way to look for life on Mars is to study pieces of Mars that we actually have found on Earth that have come over millions of years from the Martian environment, knocked off the surface of Mars by uh, high energy impacts by asteroids, and eventually find their way to Earth and, and fall onto the surface. And there was a ve very famous um, meteorite found in Antarctica called Allen Hills 84. 001, and this meteorite, ooh, that's dark. This meteorite's about the size of a, of a t potato and was found in 1984. It wasn't realized it was from Mars until 93, and then when it was examined, there was some interesting circular features inside that are made of calcium carbonates, which are related to water, and uh, some microscopic... Uh, uh, creatures that looked for all the world like fossil microbes. So there was a, a, a huge press announcement in 1996, and, and the NASA sponsored it, and it was very exciting. And, uh, and scientists around the country spent the next six years trying to prove them wrong. And they were finally sort of discredited, except for one part of their discovery, and the strongest evidence that there was life in this meteorite from Mars is that they found some interesting little crystals of uh, magnetite that are magnetized iron crystals. And they, for all the world, looked exactly like crystals that are inside of magnetotactic bacteria. Those are bacteria that actually create these crystals in their body and then use them to guide themselves through the water. It's kind of like a compass, so a biological compass. And these crystals are a certain shape, size, and they have a crystal structure that's kind of unique. And those are the kind of crystals, 25% of the magnetite in this um, rock from Mars have exactly that shape, size, crystal structure, and everything else. So, ooh, how do you explain that? It's very difficult to explain. So, is that proof for life on Mars? Probably not, but it's uh, some interesting evidence. Okay, another word, way to search for life on Mars is remote sensing. Uh, you can do it from Earth. You can do it from orbit around Mars, and you're a long ways off. You look down, you look for color changes, you look for seasonal changes, you look for features that represent life. And uh, the first thing you have to do is understand your, your planet pretty well, and they do that by mapping. And this is a topographic map of Mars. Uh, the colors represent the, uh, the height above a certain surface uh, level. And the northern plains are all blue, which means they're low. And the southern plains are all kind of orange, which means they're high. And the separation between north and south is about four kilometers, two and a half miles. So that's a very interesting way to run a planet, to have one half the planet be low and one half high. But that's the way apparently it is. And these little dots represent the six places where we've had successful landers on Mars, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But what you see from space is that there are volcanic features. These four white dots represent volcanoes. Some of them are large. Uh, well, when I'm in Arizona, I say this one is the size of Arizona. That would be Arizona right under Olympus Mons here. 
and uh, maybe this one's the size of Iowa. But they're very large, and they, they can be as high as 75,000 feet high, much higher than uh, uh, Mount Everest. Huge canyons, 3,000 miles long, old river features that all kind of converge into this little, what might have been a bay. And some people are convinced that this used to be an ocean bed up here. We don't know for sure. The arguments go back and forth in Mars science. So depending on which year you go to the meeting, you can find the, the um, consensus flipping back and forth between a dry planet and a wet planet in the past. Huge craters have impacted. That's 1,500 kilometers across and nine kilometers deep, which is what, 1,000 miles across and six miles deep. So that's a huge uh, crater and very old. That, that sort of reset the surface. When this thing hit, it was so huge that it rained down all of the surface and kind of made it into a, um, a surface from which everything else we see here has happened afterwards. It's hard to find parts of Mars that predate this huge impact. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. <clears throat> when we look closely, and, and the next picture will be from right here, going down into that uh, big crater, you see what look like old river channels. And they run not from snowy mountains, but from uh, what looks like some sort of eruption out of the ground. And the water would have run down to the bottom of the basin here. So at some point in the past on Mars, somewhere between, say, three and four billion years ago, there was a lot of water. These are huge channels, many miles across. And the flow rate at the time they were running would have been much more than the Amazon River. So these are huge, huge river channels. We see other kinds of channels, too. Um, we see deltas. This is a delta like the Mississippi Delta. There's a, a channel coming down, and it must have come into a lake because this kind of delta feature happens when a river runs into water, like the Mississippi into the um, Gulf of Mexico. You get a nice big delta shape there, easily seen from space. And here you can see that delta function, and the, uh, the river would have come down various ways over time. You could also see old channels that have, you can still see the inner uh, uh, channel of the of water and then the broad valley that it formed over time. So clearly, uh, Mars was once a wet place. And some people think it's still a wet place because you can find modern gullies that are coming down the sides of craters. Here's the, the edge of a nice crater, and you can see that there's recent features coming down recent because they have no craters on them. And some people think this is snowpack here and therefore melts underneath and flows down these gullies. You also see things that look like glaciers that are active today. It's covered with rock and soil, but underneath to create these flow features, there must be ice. So even today, there's activity of that sort. And if we look for ancient features, we can find old lake beds. And lake beds are shown by layer after layer after layer of sediments. These are dry lake beds that have been eroded by the wind. And you reveal all the layers of many seasons of deposition of sediments brought down by the rivers and deposited in the lakes. So this is really an important discovery because when you want to send a rover, which is what we're doing this year, the Mars Science Laboratory, which I'll talk more about, you want to land in a place where you have a chance, uh, you know there was ancient water, you can look at the clays and the sulfates that, are, that make up these layers, and uh, they're excellent breeding grounds for ancient life forms. Clay is thought to be a place where life has a chance, a better chance of developing in other places because clay has openings between layers that concentrate the prebiotic minerals, otherwise they tend to get very dilute. One thing we can see all the way from Earth telescopes is, uh, well, this is the Mars globe here. It's a little dark. And these bright features here, red, um, green, and blue, are indicators of methane, methane coming out of the ground. Um, it's in the Nili Fossae region of Mars. And there's a big argument in uh, the science community today. Is this underground biology? where there's 
composite, decomposition or methane release from microbes, or is it a geologic process, which is just as intriguing because you have to have liquid water and heat in order to um, um, create the geologic conditions where you can make serpentine and uh, release methane. So there's a lot of new indications, and this is active line of research, and I think the next decade we will have orbiters that are looking at high resolution at these releases here and trying to figure out exactly which crack they're coming out of, and they'll probably uh, be the focus of future missions to the surface. But of course, the best way to look for life on Mars is to actually go down to Mars, land on the surface, and start to ask uh, questions about, gee, is this a place where life could have evolved and are all the conditions for life found here or are they not? And so we started in 1976 with the first landers, uh, the Viking landers. They went to Mars with two orbiters and two landers. This was uh, the bicentennial of our country. And the idea was to land on the 4th of July in uh, 1976, 200 years after the founding of the country, and, and find life on Mars. And, well, we didn't succeed in either one. We landed the 20th of July, and we did not find life. We found a dry, rocky, dusty uh, location that uh, had no organic material at all, organics being carbon-based molecules of the type that we're built of and all the food we eat is built of, uh, carbon-based systems. If you have no carbon-based molecules on Mars that are um, organic, that is uh, reduced rather than oxidized, CO2 is not an organic molecule because it's carbon with oxygen. You need carbon with hydrogen. So this is not a place, according to Viking, where you could find any organic material, and therefore all the um, other life detection equipment was deemed to have uh, given false signals when they got positive signals because without organics there couldn't have been life and um, and what they learned from Viking was from two landers thousands of miles apart that it's a hyper dry soil you cannot hope to find much water in this soil uh, there's no organic material and they knew their instrument worked because they could see some of the cleaning agents carbon hydrogen chlorine uh, molecules and the life experiments, which returned actually some positive results, were thought to have given those results because of the unusual chemistry of the surface uh, constituents, and there must be powerful oxidants or some sort of uh, hydrogen peroxide type thing that would have caused um, what looked like a positive reaction. And they also determined that the surface of Mars was not indeed hazardous to life because there's no ozone layer and therefore, the intense UV radiation that's blocked by our ozone layer could come right down to the surface. And if you were going sunbathing on Mars, you would need more than sunscreen because it would take the skin right off your bones if you lay out in the, in the sun for a long period of time. Very hazardous. <clears throat> so this did not look good. And so for the last 35 years, these Viking results have led us to believe there is no possibility of life on the Martian surface. This has become sort of a truism. And this was kind of um, emphasized by the Pathfinder mission, which saw no hint of life either and, and really saw a place where volcanic rocks and dust were the dominant uh, species, if you like. And uh, later on, there's the, uh, the two Murr rovers, uh, Opportunity and Spirit. And uh, this is the Opportunity rover uh, landed in a tiny crater. You can see um, part of its arm right here as it just drove out of this little crater it landed in. And there's, amazingly, right in front of this lander is a, a group of sedimentary rocks, rocks that are laid down by the action of water and perhaps also by uh, uh, dune forming processes. Could be both uh, water and um, uh, dune f dunes that uh, created those layers. It was amazing because these are airbags under here uh, we landed with airbags and bounced and bounced and bounced and then rolled into a tiny crater. So it was called an uh, interplanetary hole-in-one. <laughs> and uh, truly astounding. And there is the, uh, the sedimentary rocks that they were looking for. I, I, I'm a member of this team, so I was there when these pictures came down. 
And there was one of the geologists, was a sedimentologist, and he says, I don't know why I'm here. It's just volcanic rocks on Mars. And there's no sediments anywhere. I mean, it may as well go home. And of course, the first picture they take after landing, there's a layer of sedimentary rocks. And he was the only one in the room that had any idea of what they were saying. So we interpret uh, the history of Mars through the history of the rocks that we find uh, on the surface. Uh, Mars doesn't talk to you. You have to go and, and pull clues out of wherever you can. And it's the rocks that hold the clues to the past on Mars. This rover, after it drove out of that tiny crater, went to another crater called, um, uh, what was it called, Endeavor, I think. And um, it actually went down inside of the crater and it found, oh, something like 10 meters of layer after layer, the history of ancient Mars written in the rocks. And you notice some of the layers are going in this direction here and then at this boundary, they move in another direction. So this is an unconformity, and this is a place where uh, some of the historic record has been erased, and then another series of activities laid down another strata, and then there's another boundary up higher. So there's many different things that have happened here, a very complex history in, uh, the, in early Mars. In order to understand these rocks and what they're made of, the rover had a little uh, scraping tool that would take the surface off of the rocks and you could see here where it scraped uh, the surface of this rock and then this one and they actually went down a whole series of steps to get the stratigraphy and look at the composition as a function of depth and they found out that these rocks are sulfates and they have some interesting hematite concretions. Hematite is an iron oxide that forms in water and so these uh, hematite concretions um, were very strange looking. Uh, let me show you what they look like. They look like blueberries. So these are the concretions right here, just piles and piles of these little, uh, almost like, uh, well, they look just like blueberries. What else can you say? And they come out of the rocks. These are halfway out of the rock here. They are being weathered out of the rocks and down on the surface. And because the hematite has a, um, uh, it's a stronger rock and doesn't weather as quickly, they are left behind after the rock completely weathers away by wind and, and perhaps the early action of water. So you can also see the layering in the rocks here, little blueberries inside. So apparently what happened was these uh, sediments had water percolating through them and wherever there was a, a little oh, uh, dislocation or impurity, the iron oxide would tend to uh, gather around it in a spherical pattern. So once you start it growing, it grows spherically. So all of these things are almost perfect spheres and uh, kind of a, a bluish tint. The blue's been stretched here. They aren't really that blue. They're just a little bluer. So the uh, ancient environment, perhaps three billion years ago, I don't, nobody knows the exact dates, um, the ancient environment would have been very acidic because of the sulfates here, and there would have been dunes because you can see the, the layering of a dune process, and it would have been a, a combination of shallow seas and fields of dunes and a strong wind pattern that uh, weathered this system over time. And there are places on the earth that are somewhat like this. Uh, uh, this place called Rio Tinto in Spain Tinto means bright red, and so the river runs red with iron oxides and uh, is very acidic and maybe something like what the environment was like on Mars. And <clears throat> you can kind of see in this uh, riverbed, there's a whole mass of organisms living, the little one-celled creatures, uh, algaes and various things that have adapted. But the question scientists ask as uh, astrobiologists is, an acidic environment, a place where life could start from the beginning. It's really a tough place to evolve into, even once you're already alive, but could you start there? And many scientists think, well, gee, you know, it was certainly wet in early Mars, but it's so acidic, could life have evolved in this environment? So it's kind of an open question now. <clears throat> okay, so while the rovers are doing their thing, uh, there's another orbiter called Odyssey that was mapping the North Pole with uh, gamma rays. And here's 
the exposed uh, water ice on the north polar region of Mars. This is uh, the summer ice. In the winter, carbon dioxide actually freezes out in the pole and makes a big uh, seasonal ice cap. But in the summer, it goes back to just water ice. And this is several kilometers thick, maybe two miles thick here, and a 1,000 kilometers across. So there's a lot of ice. And uh, you can see that it's just surrounded in this very dark picture by uh, soil. But if you look with gamma rays and neutrons, you can see that it's underlaid with water ice. So in the upper few feet of the surface, just like on the Earth where we have permafrost, we have permafrost on Mars. You can't see it with a camera because it's buried, but uh, you can see it with neutrons and gamma rays, just like when you go to the hospital and get an MRI scan, you can see inside of your body uh, and map the inside of your body without slicing yourself open. We don't have to go and dig to see what's in there. Unfortunately, this instrument is very low resolution, so the footprint is about the size of this thing here. So we just know regions have more water. This inspired the Phoenix mission, of which I was lucky enough to uh, be the, the principal investigator and the leader, and came up with the idea of landing. Well, the circle is right there, but it's right about here. And um, we... Uh, we're selected in 2003. We had four years to build our spacecraft. And then came the scariest part of all, which is what we call the seven minutes of terror. And that is landing safely on the Martian surface. There's no problem hitting the Martian surface. It's landing safely that's the hard part. It's, uh, we have enough navigation ability that we know we can hit the planet. But it's very difficult to come in at just the right angles, to j just uh, the right place, and come down safely. And I wanted to show you in a um, um, in a quick video here just why it's so dangerous. I hope this isn't too dark. Okay, we come in at 15,000 miles an hour. We've just ejected our cruise stage and hitting the atmosphere at that speed, even though it's thin, creates a lot of friction and a lot of heat. So we come zipping around through the upper atmosphere, and it's only when we th slow down to 1,000 miles an hour we can release a parachute. Now, this parachute will slow us down to about 100 miles an hour, but you're not going to hit the surface at 100 miles an hour because it's, the atmosphere is so thin, you have to do something else. And after we take this picture of the surface here, we do the dangerous thing, the most dangerous thing of all, free fall drop towards the surface, stopped only by 12 thrusters. Now, the 12 thrusters, it, I hope it wasn't that bad coming down. The 12 thrusters bring us down safely to the surface, and then we can open our solar panels. Without solar energy, we can't run the mission. So it's really important that they open. And then we have a, a camera we built at the university, same kind of camera as uh, the Pathfinder one, and that pops up. We have a mast for measuring temperature, and we have inside of this bio barrier a uh, robotic arm. So the mission of this uh, spacecraft, the Phoenix spacecraft, is not to drive around on the surface like the Mir rovers and look at the ancient environment. It's to dig down to that ice that's there now. In other words, we're following the water, even if it's frozen, and to find out if that ice ever melted by looking at the minerals in the soil. And we did determine that there was calcium carbonate there, which forms with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere plus liquid water. And so we think, indeed, there has been melting in this ice. And so here we are gathering a sample, putting it in one of the instruments on the deck, and determining that it has calcium carbonate in it. This piece over here is a LIDAR, and in a second, You'll see it open its lid and shine a laser beam, and I'll show you an example of measuring uh, um, the clouds in the sky using a laser beam. So that's, that's pretty much uh, the mission in a nutshell. But as we landed, and here's our landing path down to this little valley here, that's about 30 miles across, and shallow valley. We were being listened to by the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter 
And since it was there listening to our radio signals as we landed, we asked it to take a picture. Well, the problem is there's an uncertainty in landing that's about this big, and the picture it can take is maybe that big. So we had to figure out which way to point it. We had to time it exactly right. And yet, even with all those constraints, we were able to find the, the parachute and the lander, and here it is in the lower left, blown up as it was landing on Mars, an, internet, an interplanetary picture that I think is just astounding when you realize how difficult it is to do this. And if you, I know it's too dark, but if, if you could see, you can actually see the wires that are holding the parachute to the lander in this picture. And even more amazing, they could see the heat shield down below, which is just a dot in this picture, so I can't show it to you, but you can actually see the heat shield um, falling off the bottom. Okay, and then once he landed, we took another picture, and uh, oh my. <laughs> I found out today that the uh, Snow Leopard operating system on my Macintosh causes images to be dark in the PowerPoint projectors, so I don't know how to fix that, but all these pictures look great on my monitor. I wish I could show you, uh, but uh, here's our lander. There's the deck. There's the two solar panels. It's a little darker around it because that's where the thrusters have uh, blown away some of the thin surface soil. And you can see the lumpiness of the surface around caused by the expansion and contraction of underlying ice. Okay, so here's an a artist drawing of our spacecraft and the idea is we can measure the weather and the climate, the physical geology, the mineralogy and the chemistry. And by using this arm, we bring samples up to the instruments on the deck. Well, we weren't sure that we were going to land in a stable position on the surface. So one of the first things we wanted to do was look underneath the lander. And so in looking underneath the lander, we came to a big surprise that we called holy cow, that these thrusters had actually blown away the soil, and here's the soil, and exposed the ice which we were supposed to be digging to, and there it was exposed. <laughs> Unfortunately, our arm down here couldn't reach over there. <laughs> so there was this moment of panic where we thought, <clears throat> we'll be able to see there's ice, but we won't be able to find any in front of us where we can actually dig. But fortunately, that wasn't the case. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is there was a strut right here, and I hope this next picture isn't too dark, but I'm afraid it might be. But when you looked at this strut, there was little blobs on it. You can sort of see these blobs. They're, uh, they're interesting. They're just like little uh, uh, droplets. It's hard to call them anything else. They're round little droplets that go up and down this leg. And the amazing thing was, over time, and this is the eighth, uh, Saul is a Martian day, so the eighth day, the 31st and the 44th, we could see these things growing on the strut. It was not shrinking, but growing. They were getting bigger. And this was very hard to explain. And two of them here, which are very hard to see also, actually coalesced. So there was a paper written. There was huge discussion within our group. There was, we formed into two teams. Those that thought those were liquid droplets caused by salts lowering the, uh, the melting point of, or the freezing point of water. And those that thought there were ice crystals and had nothing to do with liquid. And so one group published a paper, and the other was too lazy to do it. So now the only thing in the literature is liquid brines existing on Mars. <laughs> so you got to publish and not just argue against it. So we took pictures around, all around the, the landing site. Here's our arm floating in space. That's because we take the pictures in little postcard shapes, and we mosaic it all together. So this is an entire panorama, and there's the two solar panels. Uh, here's the workspace. Here it is blown up, and here's one of our first trenches, and thankfully there's some little white material in there. But before we looked in the trenches, we did a very detailed analysis of this uh, terrain around us, looking for any sign of life. And in fact, if you think of the little white dot out here, what we really hoped to find was uh, evidence of life that couldn't be doubted by anyone, and that would be a polar bear but, or a Martian bear. And unfortunately, that was not what we saw. But we did look at the ice, and 
Um, in this little circle, again, very hard to see, there's three little white clumps that were scraped off of this white material, and uh, four Martian days later, they disappeared. A Martian day, by the way, is 24 hours and 40 minutes. 24 hours and 40 minutes. Okay, so our job for the rest of the mission was to bring samples from the surface up to the instruments on the deck, and there's a camera here where we can look in this scoop, and we can see Martian soil up close. That's about three inches across, so there's big lumpy things all over the place. It's caused us no end of trouble. We could put it into a microscope, and we could find out there was two sizes. There was uh, 50 to 100 micron sizes, and there was little two or three micron sizes. Two distinct size distributions in the soil, and the big ones had a lot of different colors. Now, we weren't able to tell what they're made out of. They almost look like um, diamonds and uh, rubies, you know. So you can imagine diamonds and rubies, although I think that's probably not what they are. But uh, if, if they were, maybe we could fund a mission to Mars. <laughs> and then we, uh, we put some soil into these little containers here. There's four different containers, all exactly the same, where we add water to the Martian soil, mix it together, and we look at the solution that forms from those things in the soil that can go into water solution. And before I tell you about that, notice there's a DVD. That DVD will be on Mars forever, and it contains all my famous favorite uh, uh, science fiction books, and it's a lending library and says, astronaut, take this with you. Um, but I've often wondered, who would find this, and when would it be? When would we actually get an astronaut to the polar region of uh, Mars? Would it be in 100 years, 1,000 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years? And if it was 10,000 years, nobody would speak English. You wouldn't find a DVD reader anywhere. And you would have to translate this thing. And if you actually went to all that trouble, if there's some Rosetta Stone translator in the future, what would they think about our science fiction stories? It <laughs> might be the only record for the 20th century in that time, who knows. But what we did find in these chemistry cells was a half a percent of something called perchlorate. Perchlorate is a chlorine with four oxygens. It's actually a, a very interesting subject. And let me tell you the perchlorate story, because I suspect most people have never heard of it. The first thing is, if you concentrate it, it'll lower the freezing point of water from 0 C to minus 70 C. You have to concentrate it. Could this be why there were blobs on the strut, concentrated perchlorate solution? It's an important energy source for microbes on the Earth. It's found in very few places, only in very dry deserts. But if it gets into water, uh, particularly our drinking water, where it's considered uh, a hazard at the parts per billion level. We found half a weight percent, which is a huge amount. Um, it's uh, on the earth to get, to get it out of the drinking water. They put in uh, biological material that eats it. They, they, they uh, use some sort of microbes. It's toxic to humans, especially at the half a percent level, which is huge. It competes with the iodine in your thyroid, so it causes uh, severe problems at these levels. I think before we send humans to Mars, we have to deal with it. So I think it's something we can certainly cope with, but thank gosh we actually know about it. <laughs> if we hadn't known about it, people, you can't help but get that fine dust into your lungs, so it would be um, potentially toxic. But there's good news. In the solid rockets that boosted our spacecraft off the ground on Earth, uh, the oxidizer is a, a, ammonia perchlorate, so it, it's a rocket fuel. could be a resource. We uh, have maps from space with this same instrument that found the ice, and uh, this is where chlorine is found on Mars. Uh, these are the two Viking landers, and this is the Phoenix lander, which is a little off the map, unfortunately. But we found half a weight percent, and if you look at the scale, that's sort of blue-green. Uh, blue so there's about half a weight percent at Viking 1 and about half a weight percent at Viking 2. Could that also be perchlorate? Well, this question occurred to a, a Mexican scientist and his colleagues, and they said, well, let's redo that Viking experiment, but let's add a little bit of 
perchlorate in with some organics. And so what are the implications for Viking if you have perchlorate in the soil and some organics? Perchlorate releases oxygen as you heat it. So the, um, the Viking experiment heated the mixture of soil up to 500 degrees and looked at the vapors coming out. Well, if you heat organic soil plus perchlorate, you get water, carbon dioxide, and carbon hydrogen chlorine compounds. So this was done uh, by a the Mexican scientist, a very nice guy. And if I can remind you of a previous slide, cleaning agents seen as carbon hydrogen chlorine molecules. Is that a coincidence? I think not. I think the Viking results are very likely to be incorrect. I can't prove it, but I think that. And I think uh, organic material is actually common on the Mars surface, not rare or undetectable. It could be there at 10 parts per million instead of less than one part per billion. This is, uh, I think, kind of a new approach to Mars science in the search for life. Without organics, you can't have life, after all. <clears throat> OK, but what happened to the Pathfinder mission? Well, after about 90 uh, days on Mars, uh, we started seeing these funny patterns in our LIDAR. This is a cloud at about five kilometers, and it's got little streaks coming down. Here is the same pattern on the Earth, and we know on the Earth these are ice crystals falling. So we saw another patterns that look like these curved streaks on the Earth. Um, and these are, this is snow. So it was snowing on Mars, and we could see the snow actually on the surface, very thin now, not like here in Iowa. But eventually, winter came, and uh, there's our spacecraft. You can't even see it in here, even with a good picture. And, uh, but that's where it is. And this is the carbon dioxide ice covering our spacecraft. And then a year later, at the same time, this is one Martian year, at the same time of year, this is right after we landed, and this is a year later, it's already going back to become part of Mars. It's covered in Martian dust. The solar panels have broken off. And our spacecraft is rapidly becoming what looks for all the world like a rock on Mars. So I don't know if astronauts will be able to find this in the future. But what about the future of searching for life? And this is the good news. Uh, this year, we are launching this large uh, rover called Mars Science Laboratory. It has very, it's, this is big. It's, you know, shoulder height and uh, has a huge arm, big camera. And... Uh, It'll be launched in 2011. It'll get to Mars the summer of 2012. And I'm predicting, although not everybody agrees with me, that now we'll finally see the organics and maybe as high as 10 parts per million, and we might find concentration. So I think the new Martian goal should not be follow the water. It should be follow the organics. And so this thing can move, and it can sniff up a trail. And uh, it's like a large dog. It can find where the bodies are buried. Uh, it analyzes rocks even at a distance. It's really a very incredible thing. It has laser beams that burn some vapors off the rocks and then a, a meter that can actually tell you what those vapors are made of. Well, there's one last way, and I'm just about done, to search for Martian life, and that is to return samples to Earth. You can do it robotically or you can do it with humans. I think we will wait till the humans go to Mars and they will be able to find these things that are most likely to contain life. And my prediction is they will bring these samples back to Earth, put it in a laboratory with the most high-powered microscope that we can find, that this will be in the future, so they'll be very powerful. You'll look down at the tiniest scale, and I think I know what they're gonna find. They're gonna find tiny little <laughs> six-legged apes, not 10 feet tall, but the scale is only off by 10 million. These are, but Burroughs was right. They're there. Thank you very much. Experiment. It has a spectrometer that analyzes the vapors brought out of the rock by a high powered laser. So it's a little different. It can work, I think, up to 10 meters away from a rock. I've never seen it actually do it, so I, but I've just read about it. That sounds incredible.
If uh, Mars is a closed system, where would the water have gone? I mean, it... Well, it either went up or down. Um, if it went up, it could get to the top of the atmosphere, and there is no magnetic field on Mars since at least uh, four billion years ago. And so the solar wind actually sputters off the top of the atmosphere, and you can lose the hydrogen that way, and then the oxygen can oxidize the surface. Um, or it went down, and some of it's in this permafrost, and, and there could be very deep layers of uh, ice on Mars, too. And hopefully under the ice layers, as you get warmer towards the center of the planet, I don't know how deep, depends on where you are, you should be able to dig a well and perhaps find liquid water. And that's for the future. What are the uh, technical limitations that have prevented us from returning samples so far? We had a mission to return samples that was supposed to launch in 2003. And it was going to be a partnership between the United States and at least France, and maybe there were several other countries. And this is how it would work. I mean, you have to get those samples off the surface, right? So we would have landed with uh, basically uh, um, uh, Earth to Earth-to-air missile of the kind the military uses. And so they would have sent out a rover, grabbed samples, brought them back, put them in the head of the missile. The missile would be turned upward and launch right off the top of its spacecraft. It would go into space where there would be an orbiter in space. And that orbiter would have to find a thing the size of a grapefruit that had a little beeper on it. Beep, 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 beep. And it would have to adjust its orbit until it came up slowly to this grapefruit and grabbed it and put it inside of a capsule. And then it would have to launch off of the orbit of Mars and come back to Earth. And well, can you just land a sample from Mars onto the Earth? What about the scary thought that there might be Mars life and it might actually be uh, evil? You know, <laughs> not evil in the sense that it means us harm, but evil in the sense that it does us harm. And so you would have to quarantine it. So you wouldn't trust coming straight into the Earth. You'd want to land it maybe at the space station or some other orbiting station and then analyze it and do uh, tests on it before you would ever allow it to the Earth. <sighs> so this mission got so complicated and so expensive that it was canceled. So we are now promised in the Mars community, which is one of our highest goals is returning samples. It's, it's one of those things that's always 10 years ahead. Well, now we're being told it'll happen in 2020. Well, first is 2003, then 2013, 2020, and you can imagine not much is happening to design this thing, so maybe 2030, maybe who knows. I've stopped worrying about it. <laughs> it's gone beyond my lifetime, so uh, it's, it's a high goal within the science community and just difficult and expensive. Plus, you don't know which samples to bring back. You want the sample that has life in it, right? Where do you get that? So maybe this science laboratory will find a concentration of organics that's so exciting that we can finally all agree that we have to have that sample back on Earth. And I think it's going to take something like that to shake the money out of the tree. Uh, my question is, um, in that huge, deep crater it looked like there was liquid water in there. What do you think? Well, that blue, because it was blue? Well, those are just uh, colors that represent height. But, you know, I showed you there was two big rivers that went down into that crater. I think there was water in that crater at one time, not recently, but billions of years ago, that might have come way up high on the, on the edge. And people actually have found what they think are ancient shorelines around that crater. So you're not far off, but it's not there now, I guarantee you. Okay, thank you again, everyone. And there's a reception, and he will stay longer to answer more questions. Thank you.